Aloha and welcome to Cooper no, Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. And today we're in Washington, D.C. It's fossil fuel free future. We're honoring indigenous peoples and Mother Earth. And right now, thousands of people are in D.C. at the People versus Fossil Fuels Indigenous Led Action. And it's a whole week of action in D.C. And the main thing is fossil free futures exploring what's being planned by NGOs committed to renewable energy and regenerative governance, honoring indigenous peoples on the front line and demanding new directions for our democracy. Very, very excited to welcome Yvette. Yvette, why did you, what's going on in Washington DC this week? We have organizers throughout our nation who are coming together and demanding answers from this administration. Where are the promises? The focus was environmental justice on his platform. The WEJAC, the, the White House Environmental Justice Council was created. So where's the action to follow all of the structure? Uh, where are the results for, for communities on the fence line like ours? And what is the remedy? Really good. And of course, we know yesterday that uh, President Biden did sign into law Indigenous Peoples Day, and we know that's important. But I think what you're calling for is where is the action looking at things such as stop number three. Go ahead, John, maybe you can share. Sure. Well, where we are right now is I'm basically on the Gulf Coast there. And uh, the problem that we're having is that the gas is being fracked in those native lands and those other areas are being shipped to the Gulf Coast for export. And we say that if you're gonna build back fossil free, you cannot continue to expand having more export facilities, more refining capacity and more LNGs. So we're here to protest that, to ask President Biden to be as good as his word. He said he was gonna be the environmental president and we expect that he do those things. So he wants us to build back fossil free, build back better. Well, then let's do it. Let's put some action behind those words. Those are really good points. And there is a lot of peaceful and prayerful participants in DC. They're sharing their commitment to nonviolent civil disobedience and new energy models for our nation going forward. In this week of action, DC is building the national consensus going forward to the UNF Triple C Conference of Parties 26 in Glasgow. If we look at indigenous rights, and that was a really important point that you brought up, we have so much work that we need to do. Yvette, would you like to say why you came from Texas and what are some of the issues that are facing the community where you're from? Of course, being from the Gulf Coast in Houston, Texas, we share borders with Louisiana. What well, we've seen the administration and the Department of Energy do to our region is release 1.5 million barrels of oil from the strategic oil reserves, is move forward on desalination projects for the sake of petrochemical refining and production. We see the expansion of export terminals. So if we're really trying to reach a goal in stopping the climate crisis, as the COP requires, by, you know, over a hundred different nations. What is our nation? What is the U.S. doing in order to curb the climate crisis? And because this year it's so important to, to really address the finance part, to, to address the fact, how are we giving security to nations that are falling because of sea level rise? How many displaced people from island nations are going through this? So where does the U.S. stand? Are we going to keep on on a path by releasing strategic oil reserves, by building expansions to fossil fuel projects, by continuing fracking and increasing the rig count every single year? Or is this president going to finally declare a climate emergency, which is what we're all here to ask for? We need this administration to declare a climate emergency, which is something Biden can do on his own. Oh, it's really good. And indigenous peoples have really led the resistance against center colonialism and this new climate colonialism. And we know there are over a thousand separate indigenous nations and populating the land before, each with their own unique culture, language, and tradition. And one of the sad parts is with the climate crisis, as you raise up the situation, example of what's going on inside small island states, or we call them large ocean nations, such as Tuvalu and Marshall Islands, this is once again, really another wave of colonization, really destroying their basic human rights and dignity. Back to Susan, I was on the front line now of the police station. Susan, can you say what's going on this week? We know it was 
led by indigenous water protectors, activists, and tribal leaders from across the country, and hundreds and thousands of people joined the first day. What's going on today? Right. Uh, well, yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day, so that was centered. And today it's um, uh, that fossil fuels are fueling the climate crisis. And I was carrying a banner that said, said stop fueling the fire. So it, it makes the point that the fossil fuels that we're burning are the main source of climate change, and that is right up my alley. Thank you so much. John, could you share a bit about why you came to DC this week and what you're able to see and what's going on back home? Sure, I came here because I like to say that Port Arthur, Texas is at the forefront of climate change. Uh, we're subject to those hurricanes everyone hears about that are in the Gulf and the Caribbean. We've had five major hurricanes in the last 15 years. The largest flooding event in the history of this country, 60.58 inches happened in Port Arthur's immediate vicinity. So we see this every day. And then we have air quality issues and pollution issues. And those air quality and pollution issues have caused a drastic change in the health of people. Matter of fact, Port Arthur is twice the state and national average for cancer, heart, lung, and kidney disease. All of these things have contributed to a situation where we believe that it is imperative that the president call this a climate emergency. We can't continue to go this way. And as you spoke of about the indigenous peoples, what has happened to them and their area is simply a matter of genocide. It's simply a matter of the promises that were made to share the wealth. You took the wealth right from beneath their feet and their lands, and you impoverished them and you oppressed them. And that oppression goes on in communities of color all across the country, like mine. So we want to be here, I'm here, to emphasize that point and to drive home the point that we must build back fossil free that he has to declare a climate emergency and that we have to move in a new, cleaner, resilient, different direction with this so that there's fairness, equity, and justice for all. Really appreciate your points, John. And we also know also in St. James Parish, the risk for cancer is almost 50 times the national average. And what you described and what's going on there definitely illustrates the environmental racism that still haunts this country. And we look at, as you brought up most recently about indigenous, if you're looking at line three, that tar sand pipeline, that's in direct violation going back, as you pointed, to treaty rights, but also to the pledges and promises that were made when running to seek the presidency. Yvette, right. what do you think we should do next to then demand a new direction for our, this nation? We need to, as a nation, join back the UNFCCC. We need to make sure that this administration declares a climate crisis. We need to respect treaties that have been set forth. And we need policies to protect island nations that are going through sea level uh, rise and climate disasters. Being from Houston and the Gulf Coast, we are all very familiar with hurricanes, increased storms, rain dumps, what's going on at our borders with, you know, so many climate refugees, because that's what we have we have climate refugees who no longer have a place to call home because we have fully developed nations with more than enough resources consuming more of the resources that are still in the earth continuing to extract and pollute and kill our communities at the fence line but also not trying to address what is the financial safety net? What are those uh, migration policies we need to have intact? Do we need to join the climate accords? Yes, we do. And do we need to defund fossil fuel industries by removing subsidies and redirecting them to communities in order to invest in a future? We need jobs, economic stability, and a safe environment. And we can do that. Now is the time. That is what building back better and this entire week is about. This is why it was led by an indigenous resistance and why communities like in Corpus Christi with an indigenous people of the coastal bend are continuing to fight uh, conglomerates like Exxon Mobil, Chevron, Shell, why we're fighting Lion Del Basel, Dow Chemical, uh, Valero Refining. The, the number of refineries and petrochemical facilities is countless. So what we need to do is start removing those safety nets, implementing them into cleaner energy sources so that our communities can transition those jobs over to renewable, sustainable jobs. We do 
offshore drilling, we can do offshore wind. We have so many Superfund contaminated sites that are pleading to be solar fields. Can we do it? Yes, we can. And we're here to show solidarity across the nation, putting our bodies and our health at risk during a global pandemic because we are suffocating in our environments and we're trapped in our homes and it's making the toxics in our communities more susceptible to our bodies. That's why we're here. DC Cueta, exactly. And that was so important. I love how you connected our domestic policies here at home and then connecting to the foreign and that's what really creates the, the global crisis. We are forgetting that we're all on one blue planet. And when we look at the people coming from the South, it's because the climate crisis that John also shared as well, it's not something in the future. Today it's Tuvalu. We used to say tomorrow it's you, but now it's so many people and it's, it's Texas today. And that's why you're coming to show and to share what's going on. So if we have better domestic policies that actually do not fuel the climate crisis, then there would be fewer people coming. The whole aspect people don't understand is also place-based. Indigenous peoples love their sacred homelands, would never want to leave, but it's because of the climate crisis that then they're forced to try to find and survive and to even thrive. And so you really did bring that home. Susan, would you like to share some aspect of what you've seen this week and why it's so important to be there in person at the People versus Fossil Fuels rally? Yeah. Uh, I just love that this movement has been indigenous led. I'm going to walk around because other people are talking. I'm in front of the park police station where people are getting their tickets processed. Really getting arrested here in DC is uh, one of the least uh, life breaking places you could go and get arrested. But um, if Juan Mancias for the Carrizo Comacrito tribe are here, and I hope he does show up later, he's fighting that fight all along the border. I spent the first half of my childhood uh, in Brownsville from when I was an infant to around seven. And so I fell in love with Padre Island and Boca Chica Beach on the coast there at the very tip of Texas. And these places are being ravaged. They're being industrialized. They want to put in too many, all these uh, liquid natural gas plants for export and uh, you name it, not to me even mention SpaceX. Um, and it's the place where I grew up with in that very multicultural space of Brownsville at the border and uh, our family loved it. And so it breaks my heart to see people from Mexico and farther south driven by the climate crisis, um, suffering at the border and suffering to try to get into this country. Thank you uh, so much. It all, it goes, all goes together into one thing that I, I must resist it on many levels and I'm willing to come here and be led away and, and ticket, just ticket it basically is what it amounts to. Thank you. John, continue the conversation. Can you share a bit? Yes. Uh, once again, I'm here to bring home the point of what's happening on the Gulf Coast and Port Arthur in particular, but also to show, just as you said, that it affects other communities across the country and that we expect the Biden administration to keep its word. I think the biggest issue we have right here now is America's own hypocrisy. America's own inability to see beyond profits and start looking at people. Uh, there's an old Indian saying that when you lose the land, when you lose that, that's the end of life. There's no more life. And we talk about the water keepers and others, and we have to have water and land to sustain life. But if we destroy the very thing that is the basic fabric of life, then there will be no more people. There will be no place for man here. And this is the only earth we have. So we're here to send a message to the administration to the president and to others that we expect you to be true to your word, to do the things that you said you're going to do, to make a difference so that we have a future and six generations after us have a future that's viable, that's equitable, that's safe and clean. Excellent points because we do look at equality, at equity and ecology. And what all of you are really bringing together is that broader picture. So it's building back better but in beauty and in balance and including the indigenous cosmology and worldview that have been ignored since colonization. So as it's Indigenous Peoples Day, it's very important as Susan said, that's indigenous led and it's pulling all the pieces together that have been ignored for too long. And John, you really did summarize so succinctly what many people forget, but maybe also in this time of COVID people understand 
you do need water, you do need land. And just last week at the UN Human Rights Council, there were two landmark decisions made in Geneva. One was the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment was globally recognized. And that was very significant, but also a brand new special rapporteur on climate change and human rights. Do you think these actions and other actions taking place in September and October will be enough to then change it, not break down as a country or a world, but break through to a new future with what's gonna happen in Glasgow next month, Yvette? One thing we have to understand is that countries participating at the COP have the ability to vaccinate. And in a time when vaccinations are rare and scarce. So as Global North communities, we have a privilege of vaccination, access to medical attention, resources. Not every country does, especially indigenous nations. We've seen how this pandemic has ravaged communities, not only in the US, but in Indonesia. We've seen it in Africa. So one thing to remain considerate of is that there is a solidarity movement that so many countries will not participate because they do not have access. And so while countries like the US maintain space, we need to keep the fact that climate change will ravage the most vulnerable, the least resourced communities of color throughout our entire country. And so that's something to keep in mind as the Glasgow conversations continue. Also to hold our countries accountable because it's not just a matter of signing a piece of paper into law or making agreements with other countries, but stations and environments like the COP have a lot of corporate influence tied into it. So how will our global leaders respond in this time to false solutions like carbon capture, like nuclear waste uh, that other countries have already faced? Will we go towards false solutions or will we go towards a more attainable natural solution when it comes to climate change, clean energy without all of the, the backlash without the human crime that's caused following it. Really good points. You're talking about a decolonization, but also a decarbonization. Yvette, if we might continue just a little bit. In the last element, you shared so much about the future that already is here and the clean solutions that exist. Could you maybe share a little bit more how we could transform Texas, but also transform our world with these alternative renewable energies, which are also even affordable. And it's no longer one of these aspects of, as John brought up of choosing profit over people, we can choose planet and people and everyone could have renewable clean energy. You that? Of course. You know, we have so many legacy contaminated sites, not only in our country, but around the world. And one uh, positive feature we saw in Texas is that beginning in 2022, at least in Houston, a former incinerator landfill site in Houston will be converted to a solar farm because there is no, no human contact can sustainably live on that contaminated land, but it will be used for renewable energy. States like Texas lead our country when it comes to wind energy, and we saw how valuable that was during the February freeze that Texas faced that killed crops, farmland, devastated our communities, froze our population stiff. And this is the, the path we need to go towards. We need to go towards what is that sustainable future. Texas's energy grid can't stay isolated from the rest of the nations. We can be promoters of wind energy on our offshore platforms and decommission those rigs and make sure that we're not just capping something that can leak in the future, but really remove and restore our lands because restoration and remedy are necessary. Uh, we can't just plan forward without looking back. Uh, that's really excellent because it also brings up the UN guiding principles on business and human rights that are celebrating a decade of existence and remedy is that third piece. So it's really important that we look at that. Susan, what do you see as well as the future for Texas with regenerative energy and, and also forming a more clean future? 
Uh, well, it's tough. Uh, we are a state full of sunshine. A small corner of it could power the whole uh, country. Uh, we're very blessed with wind energy. We have a natural system that could power all of Texas because we can get wind energy from West Texas. We can get wind energy from the coastline during that time of day when it's needed in the grid to distribute the power. So we're very blessed. A little bit of connection to other grids would help. But, uh, but we have to fight a system that's very skewed toward the fossil fuel interests that owns the Capitol building and everybody in it that basically, uh, you know, we're the sort we have in our state and also uh, lapping over into New Mexico, the Permian Basin, which is one of the world's greatest uh, oil reserves. So there's a great deal of wealth to be had there. And we have the Texas coastline with many ports and that's why they're building out there as fast as they can. And the pipelines all across Texas, which are tearing up, you know, uh, if Juan were here, he'd talk about all the burial sites and native uh, sites that they're aware of all over Texas that are being destroyed. And you get that out there and you get it exported and it makes the rich people richer. It's not about energy independence. And we, um, us allies here in Austin are trying to do what we can at the Capitol, but we need a transformation because the regulatory agencies in Texas just rubber stamp everything. So that's why we're here talking to Biden because he can overrule what's happening in Texas. There's no friction from where the oil is to where the coast is, except from the federal government. And we need that from Biden. Thank you so much for connecting all the dots and the important aspect also of our democracy that this is really also when we vote and when we share our voice that represents our values and also the vision of what we desire for this country, but for the world. John, would you like to build on that? Yes, I would. And you're exactly right. With the stroke of his pen, with an executive order that he would sign, Biden could change the course of history. America loves to talk about being a leader, but to lead, you actually have to do the hard work, the hard things. I think President Kennedy once said, we don't do these things because they're easy. We do them because they are hard, because they are the right things to do. And we're faced at a critical juncture in history, whether we're going to continue to do things that are going to destroy the very earth, we do, which we all live and depend on, or whether we're going to seek a different path and a different and better way. And it's going to be incumbent upon each and every one of us to support those kinds of efforts, to uplift each other, uplift our voices, and move this country forward and push our president. We have to get behind him and push him. Uh, I think it was something that was Dr. King was doing once, and uh, he, he went to speak to one of the presidents, and that president told him, he said, you basically have to make me do this decide to do the civil rights bill. So what he did when he left out of the office, he was in there so so not very long. They said, well, what did you say? He said, what are we gonna do? He said, we're gonna go home and we're gonna push. And that's what we have to do. We have to push in every way and always possible at the ballot box, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, collectively and individually. If we wanna see change, we have to be the change we seek. And that's where a better world begins with each and every one of us. So we're gonna have to, roll up our sleeves and go to work. And I'm eager to do so. And this is prime opportunity to talk and share with others and encourage each other and move forward in that progression to build back fossil free and to change this thing from being PR, money and politics over people. It's the people versus fossil fuels and the people are going to win. We have the power to do it. Excellent and push, I just thought about it, could actually stand for planet, unity, sustainability and human rights. So we will pull all exactly. those forces together moving forward. And we have a couple more minutes. So in, in our final aspects, Yvette, what's the goal for Glasgow as we're on that human rights road to Glasgow? Do you think we will make it? And what will the actions this week do to make sure that it is a possibility to protect our planet? Glasgow this year will be all about building back better will be about how can we talk about transportation, jobs, the economy, and the environment, and maintain a sustainable lens through that entire process. Our goal in Glasgow is going to be to uplift uh, the global south and nations that are scarce with COVID vaccinations and make sure that they have access to not only vaccines, but have 
access to resources to deal with the climate crisis, because we cannot forget that just because we're here as a collective unit, we are not going to stop the inevitable. And the inevitable is extreme temperatures, is extreme weather. And so we need to make sure that those safety nets are in place. I believe we have a strong chance to show unity, people power, and put ourselves in the line of fire once again to continue those conversations because having a global conversation is necessary to address a global issue like the climate crisis. Thank you so much, John. Any closing words looking towards Glasgow? Yes, Glasgow is going to be a signature moment, not only for the world, but for this country. We're going to have to decide and make the decision of where we're going to go from here. Are we going to continue to expand the petrochemical industry or are we going to look toward a cleaner, brighter, renewable, and a just future for all. So Glasgow, in my view, is going to be the tipping point. And America has to step up to the plate and do what's necessary to be the leader it claims to be, to take the measures that it claims it's going to take, and that Biden has to be true to his word. He has to not just do it in word, but in deed. He has to do it here at home. And if he does it here at home, it will encourage other nations to do the same. So I'm looking forward to Glasgow very much as being a signature moment in history and how we're going to address climate change and the future of this world. Thank you so much, all of you, for taking time out from the People versus Fossil Fuel Week of Action in Washington, D.C. We hope you have a safe return home to Texas and look forward to continuing through Glasgow and going forward. Mahalo. Mahalo here, make a Mahalo.